Hi, everybody. This is Akiko Fujimoto. I'm the music director of the Mid-Texas Symphony. Um, so thrilled that all of you are joining us today. Uh, we have a fabulous season opening concert on September 11th. Um, it is titled Celebrating the Americas, and it celebrates America's North, Central, South Americas, the music from all those countries, and uh, of course, the people that live there, and uh, wonderful, wonderful cross-cultural pollination that happens. Um, and uh, it's all about how music breaks borders and how we really are one America. Um, today, I'm delighted to be joined by my first guest today. Uh, it is our principal clarinetist, Vangel Tangaroff. Hi, Vangel. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kiko. Vangel will be our feature soloist uh, on a clarinet concerto by Artie Shaw. Um, this is the part of the concert where we are focusing on North America and, of course, the United States of America in particular. And uh, what's more American than jazz? So this is a jazz concerto. Um, Vangel, when I first approached you about doing this concerto, um, I wasn't sure how you were going to react. Um, what's the first thing you thought? Well, it's very interesting. Thanks for asking this question. Uh, um, I remember when we had, had this conversation. I don't know if you would believe me or I don't remember if I told you about this, but uh, probably, probably maybe a year or maybe less than a year before you approached me, for some reason, I don't know what that was. Was that a, some kind of uh, sixth sense or something? I was really into this piece. Actually, I ordered the music. I started working on that piece because I really liked it. And I, and I wanted to get more and more acquainted to it because I was uh, planning to search for opportunities to perform this repertoire. I have a great admiration to Ari Shaw and uh, is uh, one of the jazz finest clarinetists. And I remember my teacher uh, telling me about Ari Shaw as being one of his most favorite uh, clarinetists of all times, together with Benny Goodman, you know, all the, the big, uh, big guys. But, but uh, I really, uh, I was really practicing this piece just for fun. <laughs> And then, uh, I don't remember, was that uh, during one of the intermissions, and you, ca you came to me and said, hey, do, do, would you feel comfortable playing Artie Shaw's concerto? And I was jaw dropped. <laughs> so, well, I know that you can play anything, and everybody, Van Gaal has soloed with the Mid-Texas Symphony and other orchestras, you know, many, many pieces. I think your most recent solo piece with uh, Mid-Texas was the Mozart clarinet yeah. concerto, maybe? Yeah. So oh, we know that Van Gaal can play anything, but I just wasn't sure because this is a jazz piece. And I thought, does Van Gaal do that? Uh, so I was so happy to know that you were interested in playing this piece that, and that you weren't scared of the jazz idiom. Now, tell me, you said your clarinet teacher also loved um, or admired Artie Shaw. What does this concerto mean to the clarinetist, the classical clarinetist? Well, I could share my opinion of how yeah. I see it. I, I'm not necessarily sure that this will be the overall perception of uh, all, most of the colleagues around the world. Obviously, this piece uh, uh, would be considered a repertoire piece for, for people who uh, are more inclined to, to study jazz or to perform jazz. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a classical clarinetist, uh, certain things in this piece could uh, could represent certain challenges. But in my particular case, uh, you know, since the beginning of my career, even as a kid, I really, uh, I was really open into the, to the popular, to the jazz music. Although I, despite of the fact how much I wanted to go in that direction, I was not allowed to. For many, oh. no, yeah, and I could tell you and the audience it's an interesting story about Please. my first teacher. Uh, um, I was uh, just starting to develop uh, my ambusher, my good habits on the clarinet, and I'm talking about the, the very beginning of uh, educating a young clarinetist. Uh, these are the most important years where yeah. you build very good, strong habits on the instrument and what you have to search for in terms of sound, in terms of tone quality. 
and I really wanted to to explore. And you know, I really wanted to play saxophone, and I want I want to try everything. And I didn't tell my teacher anything. Nobody knew. But I uh, called a friend of mine who had a saxophone. I told him, hey, give me that sax for, for a couple of days. And I didn't tell my teacher. I started practicing saxophone because uh, both instruments are quite close. If you, if you could play clarinet, it's, it's not that hard to transfer everything you know in the clarinet to the saxophone. So I started practicing saxophone for a couple of days. And one day I'm going to a lesson. My teacher doesn't know anything. My parents knew it, but they, they were not staying in, in close touch with him. They, they wouldn't communicate about that, my choice. So I'm, I'm going to a lesson. And then I start warming up. And my teacher went to, to the restroom and comes back. And coming in the room, the first question he asked me, he, he asked me, since when you started playing saxophone? No. He can tell just from your warm-ups? Yes, I was Joe Drop. Yes, he was able to tell depending on how I searched for the sound. Mm. He felt some differences in terms of approach, in terms of I'm talking about you know a very early a de for de a developing right. or, or developing as, a, as an instrumentalist. You know, later uh, later age when you already have established good good uh, stable habits, etc. That's not a problem. But right. very early, so he told me. You have to decide what you want to do, because if you spread out in so many different ways, mm. you might not be somebody that the people will remember. So wow. you know, this was very early in my career. And since then, I never, ever, I mean, it, it was something, but I really wanted it. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I was with the clarinet <laughs> yeah, maybe this is the next best thing you know to play a jazz concerto on the clarinet is the closest yeah, yeah. to the saxophone exactly. and i would always enjoy that uh, it was never been for example we're talking about different pieces like rhapsody in blue the glissandos and all that kind of, right. all the effects i always enjoy them i know for some colleagues uh, this could become quite a challenge and yeah. uh, some people study how to approach things uh, in my case, the, these things came in a very natural way. So I always wanted to go in that direction one way or another. And as I said, I already had the music uh, in kind of practicing it before you <laughs> you invited me to play. So I'm so looking forward to play it. Well, we're, we won't tell your teacher that you're doing this. <laughs> no, I wish well, you could uh, hear. I'm oh, sorry? He could hear, um, I wish he could hear you too. But yeah, yeah. I, we'll I bet you he had some experience with uh, young students trying both. I bet you he he had other younger students before you that tried to go. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Go to the oh, other yeah. the dark side. Um, <laughs> so tell me, um, who was Artie Shaw? Well, for me, Artie Shaw was uh, one of the king of um, the swing, together with uh, Benny Goodman and. Uh, um, when I when I listen to his playing, it's um, his uniqueness for me. He has a special place uh, it, it, with something that I particularly like in his playing. There is uh, there is a very fine um, uh, line of delicacy in his playing that I I hear in his tone, mm. uh, exactly in his tone in all all of. All of the uh, the different things that he achieves, well, because you know we're talking about very strong tradition. About uh, uh, it, it comes from here. I mean, all these players, so it's, it's in incredible. And but he uh, uh, really uh, managed to 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 put his own mark with with his tone, with his taste yeah. of things, which yeah. related one way or another to as a classical player. To the classical music, listening to his jazz improvisation, to the structure of what he does. Now that I play, play this concerto, it's very, very classically organized. I mean, I in terms of form, in terms of structure. So he was incredibly educated uh, um, musician, but also he performed with that incredible taste of everything. Because uh, when we talk about art, you know, uh, we could very easy cr across that threshold line of things that we could do and when you, when you go on the other side things are not as 
as uh, fine as they should be. So I, for me, from my point of view, Artie Show was the, the 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 player who always kept that that uh, incredible quality in his style and and, and playing. Mm. And uh, in terms of the concerto um, and my approach to it, uh, you know, I always believe that this repertoire. Uh, there are two ways to approach this repertoire. Uh, you know, one way is to approach it with a certain amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, jazz trained musicians, they allow themselves to reinterpret, to improvise, to bring that piece on a different level of improvisational level. Right. Uh, and the other approach is to, uh, to, to be very uh, strict to... Uh, to the main idea, to what is written, what is recorded. So I, my plan is to uh, really uh, approach the piece from, from this angle and to try to represent uh, exactly what the uh, artist show uh, wanted, recorded. We have recordings nowadays. So I hope that uh, this approach will be appreciated. I think that's a great idea. And I do think this is very much a composed concerto. It's not an improvised concerto. Uh, everything, every note that's written out, if you're not looking at the music, it could sound like he's improvising, mm -hmm. but it's really composed and thought out. Um, so I think your approach is perfect. And um, the one word I have for this piece is virtuosity. I think it doesn't matter what the style is, it's so virtuosic. And uh, it's a, I think it's a showstopper and the audience is gonna love uh, hearing you play it. Um, and um, yes, I'm really excited to hear you play it. Me too, me too, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so once you're done with this concert on September 11th, uh, what do you have coming up? Um, for people who know me, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward, I'm enjoying playing with different, um, orchestras uh, uh, here in the air I perform principal club clarinet with the Austin Opera mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Mid-Texas Symphony Victoria I'm combining all the the different uh, groups here I'm doing my best I want to spend more time and more time with colleagues I recently received an invitation to perform uh, with the Houston Grand Opera for two of their major productions of La Traviata and the uh, Wreckers so that's the next thing on the road for me uh, also, I'm, I'm so looking forward to work with my students. I'm trying to be as strict as possible to give them the right amount of attention because that's the hardest part to work on the schedule that allows me to, to, to be able to combine all of this. Uh, and that's my top priority. I want to make sure that I've spent the right amount of time with them. Uh, and then the standard, they, they enjoying it. Uh, uh, so... That that's my plan for now. I, I'm constantly trying to combine both uh, performing uh, uh, and teaching. So I think both things are important for every musician. So yeah. I can can complain. Uh, you know, I have some uh, uh, chamber performances scheduled, making plans for uh, the festival that I started five years ago, which we didn't do because of COVID for two years. It was planned mm -hmm. to. It's called Clarinet Fiesta, Texas State. Each year, I'm bringing a lot of artists from around the world, clarinet choirs. So it's a weekend-long um, clarinet party. <laughs> uh, so this thing comes in the uh, it comes uh, comes in the spring. But the most exciting part that follows the artist show is the wedding of my older daughter. Congratulations! When is that? Twenty sixth of September. So it's wow. immediately after this. So you're nothing busy else, nothing else matters so we have a great party i have some uh, folks coming from overseas and oh that's so, fantastic so that's that's the most important important part father of the bride yep yeah very, very important role here so i have to <laughs> yeah <put myself. laughs> show up and do yeah, your thing exactly. that's exactly. oh you must be so proud that's incredible congratulations thank you Thank That's you. awesome. Well, you have an incredibly busy fall professionally and personally, it sounds like. So that is fantastic. Um, and once again, I'm so looking forward to performing the Artie Shaw Clarinet Concerto with you on Sunday, September 11th. Thank you so much, Vangel, for joining me.
Thank you so much, Akiko. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to it. See you soon. See you. Bye. Hi, everybody. So that was our principal clarinetist, Vangel Tangeroff, performing Artie Shaw's clarinet concerto, or talking about performing um, Artie Shaw's clarinet concerto on September 11th. We're very, very, very lucky to have him with us to play that. Uh, before we go on to our next guest, I wanted to quickly talk about another American piece that we're doing, North American piece we're doing, and this is also from the USA, um, and it is a piece by Florence Price. Florence Price um, has been getting a lot of attention the last few years, um, but not always. Um, she passed away in the 1950s, um, and after that, her music was forgotten, um, even though she was the first African-American to have her symphony performed by a major orchestra, the Chicago Symphony, um, and uh, she wrote so much music and was very, very active, um, but her music was forgotten until a couple bought a dilapidated house in Illinois and uh, discovered boxes of manuscripts by Florence Price. And um, since then, her music has been on a roller coaster ride. And she's very known for her symphonies. You know, the Philadelphia Orchestra just won a Grammy for recording her first and third symphonies. But um, what we're doing um, for this concert is called Dances in the Cane Breaks. Uh, this is kind of a short, um, vignette of life in southeastern USA um, and uh, the Black American culture and life in the, uh, America and uh, in the marsh of uh, with canes um, growing um, perhaps in Louisiana or somewhere like that. Um, and uh, these are just very lovely dances um, that are based on ballroom or salon dances. So the rag um, or slow drag. Um, and a cakewalk. So that should be really lovely. Now I want to go south of the border um, and uh, bring in our next guest um, who is right from home, um, Seguin, Texas. Um, but we're, um, her group is going to be performing with us on a Mexican piece um, called Wapango by Moncayo. So let's bring in Dr. Yvonne De La Rosa. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing wonderful, doing wonderful. Thank you for having me today. You sound and look fabulous. I love the background that you have, the flowers and the plants, very nice. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, much more interesting than my gray background. <laughs> um, so everybody, um, Yvonne is the executive director of Teatro de Artes de Juan Seguin. Um, which is a Mexican cultural center, um, Mexican American cultural center right here in Seguin, Texas. And this is the first time that the Mid-Texas Symphony is collaborating with Teatro. Uh, the Ballet Folklorico group from Teatro will be performing on one of our pieces in the second half called Wapango. And Wapango was composed by um, Moncayo, a very, very important Mexican composer. And it's become so beloved that now a lot of people consider it the second or unofficial Mexican national anthem. Um, and it's a wonderful uh, piece of music as is, but I thought it'd be wonderful to have the dancers from Teatro join us. So welcome Yvonne. Before we get into Wapango, please tell us a little bit about Teatro. So Teatro de Artes in Juan is a nonprofit cultural arts center here in Seguin, Texas. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary all year long. Congrats. And this kicks, thank you. This kick starts our 40th anniversary. Um, we promote a better understanding of the Mexican American culture and its people through the study, teaching, practice, and performance of the arts. And we have any, any, anything from Locorico dancing to mariachi to conjunto classes, culinary classes, agriculture camps. Um, Whatever we do at Teatro is definitely cross-generational from the young at heart to the, to the young. Yes. Um, we, we try to in, encircle all walks of life in our building and our, all of our events. And so we're really excited to be part of this endeavor with um, the Mid-Texas Symphony. Fabulous. Uh, now, when I invited um, your group to dance to Wapango, I remember visiting um, 
the, your building, teatro, the office and the practice um, space. And there was a beautiful mural on the back wall and there was a closet with all your costumes. Will you be busting out some of those costumes for this dance? Yes, yes we're really excited. We have a wonderful the audio team, which is a costume team that has put together some beautiful costuming for this event that coincides with the different regions and states that our performers are going to be dancing. So we have any, we have the Aztec indigenous peoples uh, regalia that they'll be wearing. Also, uh, the Stuario from the states of Veracruz, Michoacan, Colima, Oaxaca, Tamaulipas, and Jalisco. So we're trying to take you on a trip through Mexico, through music, and through our dancing. Fabulous. So in span of eight minutes, uh, the audience will get to enjoy so many different styles of costumes and dancing. Um, and, you know, until I worked for the San Antonio Symphony and conducted their Fiesta Pops concerts back in the day when I was their associate conductor, I didn't fully realize how unique um, each region or state in Mexico was in terms of their dresses and their dancing. Uh, and I learned so much um, from my colleagues over at the Guadalupe Dance Company down in San Antonio. And so when I found out that Seguin had teatro, I was like, I've got to collaborate with them one of these days. So because, you know, I don't live in Seguin, I'm, I'm only there during the weeks of the our mid Texan concerts. Tell me, why is teatro in Seguin? Well, Teatro in Seguin because there was a need in our community um, for children and adults to reclaim their culture, their heritage, their language, traditions, knowledge, and celebrations. And 40 years ago, there was a, a three individuals that said, we need to do something in this community. What do we need to do? They were educators. Two of them were educators and um, got together and and said, what does what, what the community need? And started having focus groups and listening to people at church and what they wanted their children to learn. And that is why Teatro was started because mm. the community wanted something for children to be able to go to that was gonna have a learning component to it, whether it was formal or informal learning about the different states and regions in Mexico, or the costuming, the uh, different uh, accessories that we wear and why we wear them. They wanted their students to learn more than just dance. And so mm. teatro was built for that purpose, but then also to transfer that knowledge to the community at large here in the Seguin community to share about the rich traditions of the Mexican American people that had been living here for many, many, many years. That's fantastic. Now, I understand that you and your, your mom was one of the founders, no? That is okay. correct. So it was my mom, uh, Vicky de la Rosa, my father, Homer de la Rosa, and my aunt, Maria Guadalupe Betancourt, that were I all see. founders of so this. You and they- Family business. Family. Yeah. Well, it's family business, but it's also something that the families around Seguin wanted, and it was going to take families to get it done. It was going right. to take lots of us to, to, to do that. This collaboration with the mid Texas symphony um, is 40 years in the making. There's been, there's been conversations throughout uh, the 40 years and maybe doing something with a symphony, but finally I feel like all the stars have aligned. Yes. Just right for this special occasion for, for our, our performers. Yes. yes. That's right. That's right. And then um, it's our 45th anniversary season, your 40th. And, you know, September 15th is right around the corner. The Hispanic Heritage Month begins then. So it's just really great timing. Uh, and to be able to do it in Jackson Auditorium at Texas Lutheran University, which is where you perform your other shows. That is uh, right. That's we are both year. very fortunate to perform there at TLU. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is fabulous. Now, do I remember correctly that you mentioned that you were a symphony, ball, uh, symphony bell at some point? I was actually a debutante. You were a deb, okay. Yeah, I was a deb uh, back in the mid-1990s, well, probably about 92, 93. Um, and so were my sisters. So we were all debutantes for okay. mid-Texas. So you were symphony girls. Um, yes, and here were. you are. Now you're 
sending your troops to dance with us. Um, now you're, you mentioned that um, there are young kids, dancers, and those that are young at heart. Without going into details, what is the age range of your uh, dance group? We're really excited to be able to bring to the community um, a range and age of dancers. And our youngest is eight. Our oldest is 60 plus. I won't be wow. Okay. 60 plus. So you're going to see um, all age ranges performing. But the most amazing thing is that we have a grandmother and two of her grandchildren who are performing together. We have two, we have sets of siblings who are performing together, a brother and a, two brothers and sisters who are performing together. We wow. have uh, the artistic director, her mother and her children are dancing. So it is a family affair at the Atro. We always make sure to incorporate the family however we can. So we're excited that they get to experience this together as a family. That's great. And since this is so intergenerational um, of an endeavor, are you hoping that the eight-year-olds will maybe bring in their kids and grandkids into teatro one day? That, you know, we are right now currently on our third, almost fourth generation of families coming through our programming. And so that is always a hope that they bring their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren to teatro to learn more about the culture about heritage, traditions, and, and celebrations of the Mexican American people. But also it's important that people know that we embrace anyone who'd like to come and learn about our traditions, whether they are of the Mexican American community or not. We embrace everybody to come in and take part in all of our programs. That's fantastic. And I think it's such a jewel in Seguin. Um, as I said, I've been to your studio and it's gorgeous. And I would have never thought because it's facing the railroad. So I didn't I never really saw it driving around Seguin, you know, every time I visited. Um, but what a jewel, you know, of an institution to have in Seguin. Um, and I think it just makes the city, you know, what it is. And it's very rich um, cultural exchange. And I think I read somewhere in your bio that you had written a dissertation about the Mexican-American experience. Uh, what is this basically your life work uh, through teatro that you wrote about? I did. So uh, my research was to um, look, take a deeper dive into the Mexican-American community here in Seguin and study the resiliency of the people. But not just that, to see and how teatro was the vehicle of cultural understanding for generations of people mm -hmm. and what we've done as teatro. So I had to put on a many hats during this time of my PhD, one being a lifelong theater member, meaning I was part of the uh, inaugural or the founding people of the Ballet Folklorico de la Rosa. I was also a founding member of the Mariachi Juvenil. So I have transcended 40 years at the author, whether I was a student, an artistic director, an artist in education, the program coordinator, or the executive director, I have a different um, lens I look through when I look at the opera. Mm. And so I wanted to, to try to capture what was it around me that made people bring their children to the opera and why were the adults coming to the opera for this education for their children and for themselves? Because in, in the time that the opera was incorporated, the work started 10 years prior to that with all of the focus groups and meeting up at church and asking questions, it huh. was trying to find an understanding of what we needed to provide to the community that was being, that had been lost in the times from the 19, you know, 1940s, let's say to the 1970s, hmm. those things that were lost at that time. And so um, I got to put on different hats and it was an amazing experience to not only see it through my own lens, but to be able to jump into other people's lenses to understand what they experienced in our community and how teatro have them um, find the pride in their culture again, find the pride in their heritage again, because yes. that seems to have been lost. Yes, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much um, for you know doing this collaboration with us. Um, 
Wapango, everybody in the audience, Wapango is going to be second to last. Um, it's going to be really um, spectacular. You know, um, it's, it's going to be like, I think I can already tell it's going to be a huge visual um, fiesta um, and the sound um, of the and dancers' I, feet. I, wanna, I do want to share that that um, it's something they won't forget. We have yes. two amazing artistic directors who came through Teatros programming as youth, mm -hmm. went away off to college and have come back. And our artistic directors are uh, Beto Rincon and Tiffany Rangel, who um, were our first ever interns at our cultural arts center in mm. the program of the Flocorico program and have now made their way to being our artistic directors. They have put in lots of hard work and time and, and vision into how this is going to look not just for our families, but the, the Seguin family. Yeah. And also the family, the people that come to the concerts, that they're going to see something very different. And we hope that it, it, it spurs them to wanting to know more about what we do at Teatro. And yeah. we're excited. We're just simply excited. I can't say it any other way other than just pure excitement and joy comes from my heart, knowing that our students and our dancers from the age of eight to 50 plus are gonna have this wonderful opportunity. I agree with you. And you know, whenever I conducted um, ballets, you know, it's always hard to meld the two art forms together. You know, we don't speak each other's languages and you really have to, you know, it's, it's it can be, a, the process can be really hard. But one of my mentors uh, told me that there's nothing like the electricity that happens at the intersection of music and dance. And I totally believe that. And I know we're going to have the electricity when we do a bongo together. So, Absolutely. yeah, Absolutely. let's have a blast doing this. Uh, and I really look forward to um, meeting your dancers soon. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Yvonne. Bye. Bye. So that was Yvonne De La Rosa, Executive Director of Teatro the artist that wants again, the Mexican Cultural Center right here in Seguin, Texas. Uh, very, very fortunate to have them um, collaborate with us. Also before the concert, I believe uh, their Conjunto Ensemble will be performing in the lobby for us. So that'll be very, very exciting. Um, so on to the rest of the program. Uh, we talked about the American pieces, the Artie Shaw Clarinet Concerto, which is jazzy, and the Florence Price uh, Dances in the Cane Breaks. Um, and of course, we talked about Wapango by uh, Moncayo, a very important Mexican composer. Um, you know, and that's the piece that Teatro is going to be dancing to. Uh, there's another Mexican piece. Um, it's called Danson Number no. Two, and it is by Arturo Marquez. He is a living Mexican composer that studied in the United States and went back to Mexico. And this apparently is the most often performed piece in America right now among American orchestras. Um, it is really popular. Um, it was made very popular, especially by the conductor Gustavo Dudamel and his orchestra from Venezuela, uh, Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra. Um, but now every orchestra in America plays it, including us. Now, and uh, this is a very sultry um, dance. Danzan uh, comes from Cuba and it became very popular in Mexico. It's a ballroom dance, it's a couple's dance. So it's very sultry and dark, sometimes very exciting uh, and passionate. Um, that's, I think, the best word for it. So I, I know you'll love Danzan number two. Um, he wrote many other Danzans, by the way, but the number two is the most popular one. So those are our two pieces from Mexico. Uh, we have many other um, countries represented. We have uh, from Argentina, a um, composer named Gina Stera. And uh, we're going to play Malambo um, by him. And this is a very, very exciting dance. Um, and uh, we also have Tico Tico, which is from Brazil. Um, and then we have two piece, uh, pieces from or about Cuba. Um, and they're both rumbas, uh, a dance called rumba. One is George Gershwin's take on a rumba called the Cuban Overture. Uh, this was inspired by Gershwin's own trip, a quick trip to Havana. Uh, and he came home and composed this 
uh, 10 minute poem, tone poem, I would say. So this is what's gonna kick off our concert. And there's a very large percussion section um, playing the Roomba um, during this piece. And then we're going to play uh, another Roomba um, called Sibone uh, by Lecuona. He's an actual Cuban composer, um, but Sibone became a very popular pop song actually in the US. And the version we're playing is an orchestration by Carmen Dragon, an American uh, composer, arranger, and he was a uh, conductor of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra in the mid 20th century uh, and orchestrated many, many Latin hits as well as other things. Uh, he was very well known for his arrangement of America the Beautiful, actually, and uh, did a lot of holiday and Americana pieces as well. But uh, he also had a LP of uh, Latin pieces, and Sibone was one of them. It's very intense. Um, a range rendition of Sibone. Um, so that's Cuban. And uh, this was inspired by his homesickness um, for his home country uh, when he was away. So um, two pieces about or from Cuba. Um, we also have, um, it's not about one particular uh, Latin American country, but about a pan Amazonian piece. And this is um, called Jungle Jaunt. And it's by an American, living American composer, Gabriela Elena Frank. And as you can tell from her name, um, she has some Latina in her. She is part Lithuani Lithuanian Jewish and part Peruvian and part Chinese. So she's multicultural, multiracial. And uh, her, this comes from her piece uh, called Three Amer Latin American Dances. We're playing the first movement called Jungle Jaunt. And uh, this was, um, she was inspired to write this by another American piece inspired by Latin music, that's West Side Story. So th the opening of her Jungle John sounds like um, the beginning of West Side Story by Leonard Bernstein, um, but it quickly goes into her own original Amazonian dance um, or dances. Uh, and it's very exciting, big timpani solo in the middle, uh, played by Sherry Rubens. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, so we covered Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, um, and of course the United States of America. Before I leave this uh, chat, I wanted to mention one very special piece we're doing in this concert, and that is called Hortensia. Uh, this was composed by Zenobio Hernandez, and Hernandez immigrated from Mexico to the U.S., and he settled in San Antonio and lived on the west side of San Antonio for the rest of his life until he passed away in the 1950s. Um, he was a multi-instrumentalist. Um, he played in the silent film orchestras at the Majestic Theater, uh, at the Aztec, um, at the Palace Theater Orchestra. He was very active uh, as a musician in San Antonio. And um, toward the end of his life, he composed a ton of uh, original compositions, mostly dances like waltzes um, and polkas. And um, a lot of Mexican musicians uh, were influenced by European music um, that came to Mexico. Um, so he was very much a hybrid musician himself. And uh, that really shows in this um, beautiful piece that he wrote um, for his granddaughter. Um, and uh, it was recorded in 2004 um, on a CD of Zenobio's music by his grandson, Ricky Hernandez. Um, and it's through him that we were able to get this arrangement uh, created by our own violist, uh, Margaret Hager, um, and she arranged it for our string orchestra to perform. So this should be a really um, beautiful tribute to uh, the Mexican American musicians that were active in South Texas uh, in the 20th century. Um, so everything is a hybrid, you know? We are all a mixture of different influences and cultures and sounds and feelings and people. And um, music breaks down borders. Music brings all of us together. And this concert, I hope, will show you that we are one America one continent.
So we're very excited to share this music with you on Sunday, September 11th at Jackson Auditorium at Texas Lutheran University at 4 p.m. We hope you'll join us. Thank you so much for joining me today, um, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.